Okay, people, listen up. This one comes to me from a listener who raises a great question, and he suggests an answer. How does the Arasaka family live so long? What about the Lucchesis, or half a dozen other high-profile corporal families that are pushing 200 years at this point? His answer? They're vampires. The world is ruled by vampires. Well, folks, I can't say I haven't thought about it that way, but let's consider the evidence. There's the obvious. They seem to live forever and they look good doing it. Have you seen the documentary recently about Hanako Arasaka? She doesn't look a day over 40, but she's currently pushing her eighth decade. They drink blood. Yeah, it checks out. They drain this city for sure. They sleep in coffins. Well, I do happen to know Saburo Arasaka spent the better part of this century in a medical tank to keep him alive. What do the med techs call it? Ah, the sarcophagus. Yeah, it's more of a mummy thing, but close enough. They can only be killed with a wooden stake. Yeah, I'm not sure about this one. But maybe someone should test this out and let me know. And now, loyal listeners, a special bulletin. Saburo Arasaka, the ancient patriarch of the Arasaka Corporation, has died. Eh, just kidding, folks. You're too smart for that. You and I both know he's not really dead. Saburo Arasaka has spent nearly a hundred years now on a quest for eternal life. He's guarded around the clock by a private army and lived for the better part of the century in a med tank designed to regenerate organic tissue. Guys like that, they don't just die. They certainly don't just get murdered by rivals. What would Saburo even be doing in Night City? No, folks, this is a smokescreen for something. And it wouldn't be the first time. If you're old enough to remember the Fourth Corporate War, there was a widespread report that Saburo had been killed by the Japanese SDF in a bid to end the war. Of course, it turned out not to be true, and the war dragged on for another year. No, you can take this one to the bank. It's only a matter of time before Saburo's going to show up on TV, tell us all he's back as CEO and ready to take the Arasaka Corporation into the next century. So listen up, people. I'm going to give you a history lesson. It's been 50 years since the carbon plague hit. What's the carbon plague, you ask? It was a disease that only killed adults. It's a terrible thing, and it left the generation of orphans behind. But at least the kids that contract it, if they survive into adulthood, they make it with no lasting effects. At least that's what the docs say anyway, but I'm not so sure. See... Back in the 2020s, just before the Fourth Corporate War broke out, this unidentified AV went down near Haywood. Whatever it was carrying, it was bad stuff. In less than a month, 600 adults had died of a previously unknown disease that just melted them, literally. The whole thing got contained, cleaned up, covered up. The CDC, back when that was a thing, said that it was some sort of flu. Yeah, like a flu that melts your body. But on the street, they knew the truth. It was a bioweapon. And on the street, they started calling it the carbon plague. Now, the story goes that the orphan kids mostly wound up going to surviving relatives or to special orphanage the Knight Foundation set up after the tragedy. And the story should end there. But it doesn't. Some of those kids weren't the same afterwards. They could do things, things that shouldn't be possible. Mind reading, hacking without a deck, telekinesis, literally comic book stuff. Story gets murky at this point, but sometime during the war, those kids all vanished. Officially counted among the missing after the downtown bombing. Some say they ran off. Another story I've heard is that some corp got wind of their abilities and kidnapped them using the chaos of the war as cover. Now, personally, I'd like to think they busted out, made their escape, and they live free to this day. So maybe some of them are listening now. If you want to tell me your story, give me a call. I'll make sure you can't be traced. And I'll make sure the truth gets known. Newsflash, people. You've heard about this relic that Arasaka's teasing to the rich and famous? It's all over the screen sheets. Copy your personality and gram into a chip, 
and your loved ones don't have to say goodbye when you finally die. Carry your dear sweet grandma around on the chip, ask her for advice, or pick me up whenever you need it. Eternal life of a sort. Of course, this is only on offer to the richest and most powerful people. Immortality isn't for squeebs like you and I, the common man. But is there more to it than that? We know that Arasak has been working on mind emulation technology for half a century now. Most notably with the infamous Soul Killer. You probably heard of it. It's a net weapon capable of copying your mind to a secure server and leaving your body an empty vessel. And what do they do with the copies? They interrogate them. There's some experimentation, a little torture, you know, the good stuff. So you, a billionaire executive, decide to get yourself copied. So your precious offspring never have to be without your sage wisdom. Or so you can give your annual speech at the company Christmas party. I mean, what would the world do without you? And Arasaka gladly makes a copy of your brain, puts on a chip, and hands it over. But not before making a copy for themselves. And that copy goes straight to digital interrogations, where they pull your psyche apart bit by bit until they've squeezed every last memory out of you. Every compromising situation, every crime, every heartache, your secret fears and desires. And now you belong to them. Literally. <laughs> yeah, someone in Arasaka's marketing division should get a race for this one. They've taken the most feared weapon in Arasaka's arsenal and turned it into a luxury consumer item. That's pretty impressive when you think about it. And remember, operators are standing by. Hey people, got something to kick around here. You remember Busan, Korea? Maybe you do, it was in the news because in 2022, it was a city of four million people and a site of one of the nastiest fights of the Fourth Corporate War. Now, just a year later, it was a city of four million ghosts, the entire population having been exposed and killed off by some unknown disease, which was incredibly rapid and lethal. Whatever it was, the Koreans did contain it, and even today, the blockade's maintained on that dead city. Or is it? I don't mean the quarantine, that's real enough. Ask anyone who's tried to sneak in. No, I mean the city. Is it really dead? It's hard to get satellite footage of the place, but a friend of mine in an interesting place dropped me some images. And let me tell you folks, something is going on. In December of last year, a fire broke out in the Donye district. Now, that's not unusual. Maybe a lightning strike, old gas line. What's strange is that in those satellite images in February of this year, that damage appears to be repaired. Now, the Koreans who maintain the blockade of the city have responded to rumors in the past. They say the city was already one of the most automated in the world before the war turned it into collateral damage. After all the people died, the machines just kept working. That even made sense at the time. Come on, it's been 50 years. Do any of you know of any machine that keeps running for 50 years without proper maintenance? I mean, Sure, the machines keep the lights on, but who's keeping the machines running? And there's something I left out earlier when we were talking about this. Those buildings that burned down in December were old apartment complexes. So what's there now? Well, according to sat photos, it looks like warehouses, at least to me. Listeners, these aren't repairs. It's new construction. Sounds to me like the official line on this one is an official lie. As usual. So hey people, Max Mike here. Now, I know you follow the news and the scream sheets, so by now I know you've heard about the assassination of those ESA officials during their big conference in Zurich, right? Yeah, the news says it's high rider extremist, lunar separatists pushing back on ESA expansion on the moon. But of course, that's not really what's going on here. It never is. Now I've got friends in let's say high places, and they told me the truth of the matter. See, a few weeks ago, a Militech espionage team infiltrated an Arasaka base in the Mare Nibium. That's the Sea of Clouds. They were there because of unusual seismic activity at the base. It's an indicator that Arasaka's moving around a lot of regolith c construction. For you dirt boys and dirt girls in the audience, let me clarify, regolith's just a fancy name for moon rocks. 
So what do they find, you ask? Only a partially completed and totally unauthorized mass driver. That's a big rock thrower. It's really good for getting cargo materials back down to Earth from the moon. And also, as we learned in the last war, it's a great way to drop rocks on cities. So you might not know this, but new mass drivers are strictly regulated by international treaty, and they're prohibited under ESA lunar use contracts. The ESA has the ultimate high ground advantage in any Earth conflict with their own Tycho and Copernicus mass drivers. And they really don't want anyone else having that same advantage, especially Arasaka. So, my friends in the know tell me that Militech seems to have fed that information about Arasaka's secret mass driver to the ESA committee in advance of Arasaka's upcoming lunar contract renegotiations. And to keep their contracts, Arasaka has taken the drastic action to eliminate anyone in the ESA who might have seen this data on their mass driver. But hey, this was sloppy by Arasaka's standards. In fact, so sloppy, I'd be really surprised if this had come from the top. I'm guessing some middle manager somewhere was just trying to cover their ass. Yo, people. So, I don't know if you saw the news, but there's a Klimt exhibit that's opening at the California Museum of Art, San Francisco, in a few weeks. I like Klimt. I was planning on going myself, but I figure there's no point. I mean, after all, it's nothing but high-quality forgeries. What? You mean you think they keep any art on Earth? No, nope. from Picasso da Vinci, Pickman, and Mablethorpe. I've been told they've been taken to a secure vault on Luna. Why? Well, that's unclear. Reportedly, it's because after the Fourth Corporate War nearly brought an end to civilization, some of the richest people on Earth got together and made an insurance policy of sorts. Keep the cultural heritage of the Earth in a secure place, out of harm's way in case of another, more serious war. And on the face of it, that's not really bad. But I've heard a darker rumor. I'll fill you in, but first, let me tell you a little story. Long time ago, I knew a guy who owned a small restaurant. Now, things were good for a while, but times change, tastes change, rent goes up, way up. So he decides to cash in on his insurance policy by setting the place on fire. Now, yeah, don't worry, I'm not giving away any secrets here. I mean, he was caught, convicted, served his time in a brain dance cube, and now he walks the streets a free man. But you know how they caught him? Before he burned down his diner, he took out all the expensive kitchen equipment and sold it. Dead giveaway. So think about this. Someone up on Luna is taking all the stuff on Earth they think has value. Maybe they're not just hoarding it. Maybe they're planning something else. Think about it, folks. And the next time you see a rocket launch from the spaceport, ask yourself this. What if that's the last shipment? So, people, listen up. I've got a story to share with you. Recently, I've been hearing about this monk that's been walking around nice city streets, healing the sick, but only those he deems worthy. Some of my listeners seem convinced that it's none other than Raish Bartmoss. Huh, Raish Bartmoss? Yeah, you know, the guy, the chief architect of the net, and later its badass destroyer. The rumor has always been he got taken out by a kill sat in the early days of the fourth corporate, but no one ever took responsibility for that strike. Is it possible Bartmoss set his creations wild and faked his own death? Did he bring down the net he created because it had turned into another tool the corporations could use to track us and to ultimately completely subjugate us? Think about it. So hey people, listen up, I've got a story to tell. It goes back to an old friend of mine, a net runner whose name I can't say on air for reasons of personal and global security. And she once told me that she knew the real origins of the net. This friend, she's been around. She started running back before the data crash, when the deep net was open to all. She survived the crash, dodged the rabbits, persevered through the net watch purges, and watched the black wall go up with her own virtual eyes. And she's not one to make up fairy tales. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because what she told me seemed unbelievable at first. 
So she tells me after a bottle and half of Joe Teal, Mike, she says, the net isn't what it seems. She continued by asking me a question. Why do you think Bart Moss named them demons anyway? Because that's what they are. Rach didn't invent the net, he discovered it. She looked me dead in the eyes and she said, the net is hell, and Bart Moss opened the door. So over the next few hours, she lays out her case. She talked about the similarities between, how did she put it, hyperfractus stratified computational data synthesis and the practices of the legendary Scholomance. She said that Netwatch has its origins in the Vatican and that the Black Wall sings in Aramaic. Now, listeners, you know I'm a skeptical guy. I don't run every rumor I hear despite what my detractors might say. And I might have kept this one to myself if it weren't for the fact that I've known her for ages and she's not a kook. So what do you folks think? I'd love to hear from some of the runners of my audience. I'm here to listen. Yo, people, I've got something to tell you that's got me rattled. Now, I'm sure you've seen the news, your noble Arasaka is the new head of Arasaka Corporation. Yeah, I'm afraid that's not possible. The truth is, your nobus is dead as a runner surf in the black wall, and he's been for the past 50 years. So I guess we should start beginning, right, people? Your Nobu, as a lot of you know, is the youngest son of old man Saburo. But he didn't take after his father, or quite the contrary. Now, when Your Nobu learned what his father's enterprise really stood for, he left. Kid ran away from home, formed a biker gang called the Steel Dragons. <laughs> they weren't just any street gang, mind you. They had a mission. Espionage. Terrorism. Assassinations. All aimed at the Arasaka Zaibatsu. And they kept it up for years, too. But it all stopped on the day those towers in Corpo Plaza came down now. That's quite a coincidence, don't you think? The official story is that after the death of his big brother, Yorinobu came home, apologized to Big Daddy Saburo, and was accepted back into the family. That's a straight-up con, people. Yorinobu was in those towers when they got wiped off the map. Maybe even helped bring them down. And all the evidence is buried under a million tons of debris. We don't know. So who's this guy, you ask? The one on TV talking about his dear old dad and the virtues of the Arasaka family business. Yeah, I've got a few guesses. It's no secret Arasaka's been working on human cloning tech for almost a century now. So it's possible this guy is some sort of mind control clone of the original Yorinobu. Wouldn't that be just like old Saburo? Your kid doesn't turn out the way you want. So you just try again. Alternately, never figured out what happened to Kay, Yorinobu's older brother, after the war. Maybe he disappeared to a black clinic and he came out looking just like his younger brother, but without the stain of the fourth corporate weighing him down with bad PR. What do you think? So people, let me talk to you about Trauma Team. You know him. You love them. And if you happen to live in Night City, they're basically the only game in town for your medical care. If you watch their ads or listen to the testimonials, they say they'll come to your aid in a pinch, patch you up, get you on your feet again. If you can pay. And that's a big if, folks. So what happens if you can't? <laughs> Turns out our friends at Trauma Team might have a unique collection method. Missed too many payments? you might just find yourself the victim of a debt recovery team. It usually goes like this. So you'll be minding your own business when a helpful trauma team rep will approach you and dose you with a quick-acting sedative. After it takes effect, the debt collectors scurry in, load you into one of their specialized transport. No one's going to stop them. After all, they're trauma team. You'll first be scanned for cyberware and natural organs. Your body will be compared to a continually updated database listing the prices for aftermarket parts and organs. You owe them 7,000 eddies from the time you fell down the stairs on the way back from the bar, so that's put up against the expected value of your parts. Huh. So is that a new Kuroshi eye you have there? Well, that's selling for about 3,000 euro dollars, and that's coming out. Nice heart you have there. Dynalar Cardio X model. Yeah, they'll take that too. 
Don't worry, though, they're not going to let you die. They are doctors, after all. No, they'll quickly replace with the cheap knockoff in the USSR they pulled out of a guy who was gut shot in a shootout last week. Yeah, it's probably still good. The Dynalar minus the cost of installing the replacement, well, that's another 3,000 eddies. Yeah, we're getting there. Your liver looks a little damaged from too much drinking, but they can still get a decent K for it. And best part, it's an original. So as long as they don't take the whole thing, it'll grow back. Livers are great like that. You can be like a sheep, constantly shorn again and again and again. So, now with your debt repaid, your account back into black, you're free to go. You wake up with a hangover and feeling kind of strange. But hey, for your trouble, they give you a voucher with a six-month upgrade from silver membership to gold, and it's at no additional cost. That sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah. How about you? So, people, we're going to be talking some good news tonight. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite places the Pacific Northwest. Since Biotechnica took over there way back during the time of the Red, they've been making a forest grow. The spotted owls are nesting again, and I even heard this Sasquatch is back. And if any of you can get me an interview, I'd really like that. But it's not all paradise, folks. There's something else going on. Ever hear of Armillaria solidipes? Probably not. But it used to be the largest living organism in the world, a single fungal growth that stretched beneath miles of the Oregonian wilderness. And that was just a century ago. Unfortunately, bioplagues, acid rain, and pollution ended that, and a fungus was declared all but dead by the middle of the century. <laughs> well, good news for mushroom fanatics everywhere. It's back and better than ever. Biotechnica has been to return this organism a top priority for their ecological restoration project in the Northwest, and they've got the patent filings to prove it. I check with the NUSA and EEC patent offices, and Biotechnica's got patents or solidipes for the purposes of soil improvement. Well, that checks out. And biodiversity measurement. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey, but what's this one? Bioinformatic neural simulation. Well, that sounds interesting. I decided this was worth looking into, so I got a friend of mine to get me some satellite images of the area of that fungal restoration. And smack dab in the middle of it is a biotechnical black lab. That's not that strange, except that the place is linked up in a big way. Transmission towers, sat dishes, what looks like even a hardline data fortress. Why all the comms? Well, I think it's because they're out there building an AI, an AI made of mushrooms. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy, but why not? It's been known for a century that mycorrhizal networks are capable of processing data, similar to our data digital networks. And a construction like this would let Biotechnica fly to the NetWatch restrictions on AIs, because no one wants to end up like EBM. But what I still don't know, listeners, is what that AI would be for. Protoanalysis? Net weapon? Genetic simulation? So, if any of you are planning to take a trip up north, do me a favor and flip over a few logs and let me know what you find. I'll be interested. So listen up, people. I've got a story to tell you. I heard something recently from a nomad friend of mine. She was telling me about some strange stuff happening out in the Badlands of the East. She said she ran across another nomad patrol five people, all mauled to death by a wild animal. But the thing is, folks, there haven't been mountain lions out there in almost a century, wolves and even longer. So what could it be? Well, I'm reminded of a story. A story told me by an old merc I used to know. He once took a job that had him fly over to Romania, looking for some corpo's missing brother. Search took him to an old village, and they decided to camp for the night before searching the woods in the morning. That night, they could hear barking, howls in the distance. Even though they knew it had to be wild dogs, the team could barely get any sleep that night. Then, just before dawn, they were attacked by animals. But they weren't dogs. They were werewolves. No, no, listeners, I haven't lost it. I mean it. 
They were werewolves, but not the ones of legend and not the ones in old Hollywood flat screen flicks. These bad doggies came out of a lab. See, it turns out that EBM had decided to back some rather unsavory sorts in an attempted coup of the government and offer these gene freaks as part of the deal. Of course, it didn't work. The coup was crushed a few months later and EBM isn't around anymore either. The question remains, where did EBM get their knockoff wolfmen? They never had much of a gene hacking division, so they must have come from some other corp. The obvious answer, of course, is Biotechnica, who just happened to own most of the land south of Night City, all the way down to the border. So what do you think, listeners? Is Biotechnica releasing experimental monsters into Badland? Maybe those protein farms down there are covered. Something broke out of a lab with a taste for human blood. It's always good advice to watch your back, but this time you might want to pack a few silver bullets next time you leave town. Just say it. So people, listen up, this is serious. I want you to think about this. You know the name Raven. You know more Dinalar, and of course, Kuroshi. They're the finest eye makers in the world. Probably you've got at least one of them in your skull right now, don't you? But do you ever wonder who's watching behind those eyes? I think it's time you do. Because those eyes aren't yours, you know. Somebody makes them, somebody programs them. Those moments you think are private? How can you be so sure no one's watching? The next time you're out doing a deal, think about it. Maybe when you pull the trigger on that job, the corp who manufactured your eyes has evidence. You think you aren't a target for blackmail? You better think hard about that last one, Chumba, and be honest with yourself. Where do you think they get the data sets for the newest brain dances? <laughs> Probably your private life. But hey, don't limit your imagination, because the corporations sure don't. What if there's stuff they don't want you to see? A little chameleon filter there, some perception coding here, and suddenly they can decide what you even get to see. Who knows what they might want to hide from you? Spies, secret labs, facilities, and of course, that kick murder squad they sent to your door because you knew too much. So, you think seeing is believing? Not with these synthetic eyes. Yo, people, I've got a story to tell you. Maybe a little bit of history. Anybody remember the bozos? They vanished from the city a couple decades back, so maybe you younger listeners won't remember, but clowns once terrorized this place. Yeah, clowns. Really mean clowns. Back in the day, Night City had hundreds of what were called poser gangs. That's a gang where all the members get surgery to look alike, or they get it on some theme, like characters from an old TV show, or dead presidents. The bozos were bio-sculpted to look like circus clowns. And they liked to play pranks on people. But then they turned, and the pranks got real nasty. So, why did I bring up the bozos, people? Well, that's because I've got someone for all of you faithful listeners to keep an eye out for. I've got a trusted source on the street that tells me we've got a visitor to our fair city from Brazil. And this guy is something else. He's got a permanent hairdo like a circus clown, and I hear he's even got a big red nose. Supposedly he's some kind of merc or arms dealer, but the rumor is he's also a genetic experiment. But hey, big nose, weird hair, could this guy have something to do with the bozos? Or maybe this guy just left his circus somewhere else. Time's gonna tell, listeners, but in the meantime, I'm counting on you to watch out for flying pies that explode. All right, listen up, people. I've got a public service announcement. It's about the scourge of our age, that chrome nightmare that you know is cyberpsychosis. It seems we can't go a day without some boosted lunatic tearing through a crowd of bystanders. The story you've always heard is that it's a psychological condition, a kind of disassociative violence. But is there more to it? What if cyberpsychosis is intentional? I once heard a theory that I think merits some thought. An old friend of mine used to say 
that he thought the biggest manufacturers had got together a long time ago and agreed on a baseline failure rate for certain devices. Bad code intentionally inserted into the mind-machine interfaces to slowly drive people up the wall, a kind of human planned obsolescence. They figure, what's the best defense against a nut job with a 23-inch telescoping blade in his forearm? <laughs> a 26-inch telescoping blade in yours. I can't say he's not onto something. Every time some psycho tears his way through a mall, sales of combat cyberware spike. Every time Net54 News runs a story on a massacre, some Arasaka exec buys himself a new yacht. Can that be all, though? It's no secret that incidents of violent cyber psychosis have skyrocketed in recent decades, despite improvements in manufacturing and design. But there is something new in the latest generation cyberware. Get ready for this, kids. It's the Black Wall. If you aren't a runner yourself, or a coach jockey, you might not know, but the black wall isn't some mystical barrier floating somewhere in the deep net. It's actually a complex hardware-software infrastructure designed to keep AI from accessing your gear, among other things. Maybe it doesn't work as well as Netwatch says. Maybe the madness of the deep net leaks over to our side from the black wall from time to time. Drive some poor chumbo right over the edge. And it's possible it doesn't really exist anyway. Maybe it's just something the media came up with. Look, I'm not saying there aren't attacks. I've seen a few myself. What I am saying is there's a million reasons why one human might want to butcher another. Hell, we've been doing it for millions of years, even without cyberware. But let me tell you, listeners, with cyberware, it's easier than ever. And on the other side, maybe the corporate and media types just came up with a word so they wouldn't have to think too hard about it. And you wouldn't either. Of course, this is all speculation. If I knew what caused cyberpsychosis, believe me, I'd tell you. It's been over 50 years since the city was rocked by the nuking of the Arasaka Towers. But we still don't really know what happened there. Or do we? We're going to be separating lies from the truth, or at least giving it a damn good try. If you listen to the street, as you should... They said old Johnny Silverhand finally took his final revenge on Arasaka. He got together with some of his edge runner compatriots and gave Saburo a middle finger so bright he could be seen all the way back to Japan. And where'd he get the bomb? You can't exactly buy a pocket nuke at the local gun store, even in Night City. But the people who back this story say he picked it up from the nomads, who in turn stole it from Militech. Well, we know dear old Johnny led the attack, and I'm pretty sure he saw his revenge. Lord knows he had enough reason to want revenge on Arasaka, but the truth is he didn't come up with a plan and he didn't bring in the nuke. The rest? Well, Johnny, if you're out there, why don't you tell us? So listen up, folks. This is Max Mike coming to you with uh, something to think about. It's no secret that the first bioplagues were released back in the 90s by the old USA. And... They were effective. I mean, there's a reason non-synthetic drugs have become the stuff of legend. It's pretty hard to make heroin if you drive opium poppies to extinction. But the plagues that came after, the ones that killed off the bananas, the most varieties of wheat, or more recently, all the cows, where did those come from? Now, if you listen to the experts, they were naturally occurring mutations of existing diseases brought about by climate change and overcultivation. Yeah, like we've been hearing that for the last 70 years. But here's the truth. There's been an invisible war going on between rival agricorps for decades now. And the casualties? Your food supply. See, this started after Biotechnica developed the formula for mega yeast. That's the primary source of chew, too, that stuff you put in your car. They learned that if they could control the organism and prevent competitors from growing their own... They could have a total monopoly, even without trying to run the refineries themselves. Instead, they just outsourced that work to Petrochem. So they decided to apply the same strategy to the food market and prevent competitors from growing anything that wasn't a licensed Biotechnica brand. They started making Terminator crops, resistant to the naturally occurring plagues that ravaged North America during the collapse. But if you don't pay a yearly licensing fee, your crop just stops growing the next season. So what came next? 
engineered viruses designed to kill anything that was in the licensed crop. Now, I've got friends in Biotechnica. He put enough booze into them so they can't lie anymore. They'll tell you that they didn't shoot first. Their European and South Am competitors started this war. And that may be true, but it doesn't change the fact that every year there are more crop failures, more extinctions, more plagues. Biotechnica today spends more money researching biological countermeasures to beat the competition than they do on growing crops or even on marketing. So you might want to think about that the next time you head down to your local All Foods to pick up your kibble and scop.